And I'm here to talk about a couple of things that we've found over these four years that are kind of the usual suspects, you know, things that you find that are kind of making your application on your services crash and how we find them, how we get them fixed. So this is kind of a repeatable process. There are two important things that I want to talk about. One of them is memory leaks, and the other one are CPU bottlenecks or performance-related issues. So let's start with the first one, memory leaks. We first have to define what it is. This is going to be pretty fast, first part. So the main cause for a memory leak, as a colleague of mine likes to say, is unwanted references. We are keeping something alive that we aren't going to be using in the future. We don't need it. So if we can represent the memory model like this, we can see that the garbage collector has kind of pointers to what it calls roots. And those roots have arrows or references to other objects, and then we have kind of a dependency graph. So when we do something like this and we say, okay, b.d equals null, what we're saying is get rid of that arrow. That's it. At this point, when d is no longer referenced, then the garbage collector comes in and says, hey, let me take that out of there, you don't need it anymore, and you're good. So that's how your program keeps running. Over time, you end up with something like this, which is the sawtooth pattern. So you start allocating memory, you allocate a bit more, and every once in a while, the garbage collector comes and says, hey, let me take care of that for you. And it doesn't do that all the time, because garbage collection is not a good operation for your service. It means that, basically, the world has to stop and it has to go and do it, right? So the problem comes when, well, you start having things that you don't need. So you have like a large bucket and then you add another one. And at this point, if you keep creating a lot of these, um, either your browser or in this case, your node application, they will crash. So this is what we were seeing. This is an actual chart from one of our monitoring services. Um, basically, what you can see is that memory went up, and it kept going up. There were no garbage collections, and the process just died. So this is a really bad situation to be in, if you think about it. Like, this is not the, the best place to be. So you have to figure out, okay, what's going on? And you have to go on, okay, find or bust the memory leak, right? Where is it? How do we find it? How do we fix it? One important thing that we learned is that if you're ever in this situation, the first thing you need to do is take control. You don't want to just start researching and leave everything as is. That's because every time the application crashes, responses to requests are not being generated. So some, re some requests are failing. You don't want that. One trick that you can do is you can increase the heap size of your process. So it's, in general, it's like 1.2, 1.4 gigabytes, if I remember correctly. If you make that higher, then your application crashes less often. The other thing that you want to do is drain connections. If your memory reaches like the 80% limit, 85, you should probably stop accepting new requests and just process the current ones. What you're doing basically is you are manually garbage collecting by restarting the process. Again, not ideal, but you have to buy time until you can find the real reason. Once you have done this, the first thing you should do is get a heap snapshot. What is a heap snapshot? It's kind of a picture of, of everything in your memory, in your heap. You can use the B8 profiler module for this. There are other tools. This basically allows you to send a signal to the process and, prof and take a heap snapshot, right? So let's dig a bit deeper into this. Like, what does this mean? What can I do with the heap snapshot? So let's see. Can you see that? Yeah, OK. So you get the heap snapshots. It's a file. You come to Chrome, Profiles, Load. And you load it, and you get something like this. What we're seeing here are all the objects in our application, in our service, and the type of them, how far they are from the root, so the distance, how many of them there are, the shallow size, which is basically how much they are occupying in memory, and the retain size, which is what's the size of everything else that they are pointing to and keeping alive. So these are fairly different. My first recommendation, if you're looking for memory leak, is check the strings. If for any reason you are creating a lot of them, strings are good because they are very contextual. Based on the context of the string, you can figure out where in, that, in your program that string is being created. 
So all of these are, of course, strings from node modules code that's always kept alive in memory. And we started seeing some of these. So this is actually, again, a real heap snapshot of a memory leak we found. And this is how we send logs to Kinesis, to our stream service. So the next thing you do is you come here and you pop this thing up and you see the retainers. Who is keeping that object in memory, right? So we have a body, and that's being pointed to by an HTTP request. This is an anonymous function, so name your functions. Like, if you name that, you will have a better name here. And eventually, we get here, right? So we see a forever agent SSL keeping a key to Kinesis, and then th there's a TLS socket. So we see that this is being kept alive eventually by, by this forever agent. So what does this mean? It means we have something like this as a mental picture. So an object sockets that's pointing to another object that has a key. And that key has an array of TLS sockets. So that's how the forever agent works. It keeps a socket or more of them alive for each of your origins, right? But if you're doing keep alive and you're doing logs, you shouldn't be creating a new socket on every connection. That's what keep alive is for, to avoid that. So that was kind of the first hint that something was off. I'm explaining all of this in a very sequential manner, but it was a bit more chaotic than that. You can see the PRs for this stuff. And it's like, well, we didn't really know exactly what was happening, right? But we had a couple of different approaches. One thing that we found is that the AWS SDK actually wasn't getting rid of a couple of event listeners, so they were always live and keep, keeping references to the strings. And the other one we found is that the forever agent was actually creating a new socket and a new connection for every time we logged. So the more our application was used and the more logs we generated, the more memory we consumed. This was like the, the fixed part. It took a lot of time, but once we found this, we said, okay, let's go back, use the normal agent and use it, uh, set it to forever, and that's it. But this hopefully gives you an idea of, well, how you can find a memory leak, figure out what it is, and fix it. Once you fix it, you'll go back to the sawtooth, right? So this is kind of the normal graph. These are not restarts that we force. This is real memory being garbage collected. OK. Um, so the other thing I want to talk about are CPU bottlenecks. Again, how can you find them? How can you get rid of them, right? That, that, that depends a bit. But in essence, when you, oh, let's say, so when you have a scenario like ours, we said, OK, we have a client that's calling an authentication service, going to a DB, and back, right? The thing is, you start saying, OK, we want to create performance tests for this to avoid regressions and stuff like that. And if you are doing something like that, you would expect a chart like this one, which has a minimum. In this case, it's 400. But that's because of latency. Um, so you go to the server, it's like 200 milliseconds, 200 back. And then you start getting the errors, right? That's probably the small bar there. It's, OK, we have some bad requests, so we don't have to do a lot of processing. The rest of them are the real responses, and you have a long tail because, well, some things sometimes get delayed. The problem is that we had this in reality. Again, not what you'd want, right? This is like what you want for customers. Um, so how do you fix it? Something's being queued. So the first thing you think about is, OK, I'm going to look in my DB, because if it's there and I just add an index, it gets magically fixed. That's it. It wasn't. Um, so we had to do a bit of research, look around, and we found this tool uh, called Flame Graphs. And what Flame Graphs do is that they provide you a representation of how much time each function is uh, taking in your program. The wider the representation for the bar of the function, the more time it's taking. So in this case, B is taking 80% of the program, C and D are, are taking the same. And what you see in hate, that's the call stack. So it's how you actually got there, right? This is a flame graph from an actual program. I don't know what program it is. I just got it online. But the good thing about flame graphs is that, oh, well, they apply to Node, but they can be applied to any program that uses functions and has this similar tooling. So you can use it for anything. Let's do another demo. OK, um, so let's see. Um, this is kind of the beautiful uh, simplification of the, of the problem that we had. So we are using this store, which has a user and the hash for that user, right? But that's the password hash. 
and we know that there's not, pro there's not a problem with the store, so we can just keep it in memory. And then we had an authorized endpoint, which basically fetches something from the store, and thus a comparison from the password and the hash, and that's it, right? So, well, where's the problem? This is actually a like, 30-line file. We have like tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of lines if you consider dependencies. So it's a lot simpler than it looks. But let's, let's not even take a guess, right? So what we can do is we can, can you see that? Yeah. OK. So we can come here and say, OK, I'm going to run this program uh, as, like, in benchmark mode using a tool called Zero X. And what Zero X allows you to do is to get flame graphs from your node code. Um, so once we run this, we do npm run benchmark. This will actually ask for my password because it requires some permissions due to kind of kernel level stuff like root. Um, and then I can generate load. So we can use AV or any other tool for this. And I'm doing 100 requests in total uh, with a concurrency of 10. So like 100 people logging in, right? And you, have, like, you really have to be patient because, well, we have a problem. This is a CPU issue. So it finishes. And it, it, like the times that you can see here are kind of similar to what we saw before. But the interesting thing is that if you come back here and you stop this, this starts generating the flame graph. So you don't even have to kind of take a guess at what was being slow. So we can just open that. OK, so. OK, so that part has no zoom. OK, so let's see. What it says here, although you probably can't read it, but it's bcrypt compare. So that's like 34% of the code. The same thing here, bcrypt compare. It's actually on different like bars, because the call stack's different depending on when the event finished parsing the body and stuff like that. But again, it's always being going to the same function. And the same thing here, bcrypt compare. So <coughs> evidently, we have a problem, and it's related to bcrypt compare. If you take a look at our implementation, we are doing something sync. So we're in Node, and we say, OK, things are async, and they are better. And we'll just change that to run asynchronously, right? But what does asynchronous mean in this case? Well, like, this is a CPU-bound operation. So it being a CPU-bound operation, it would block the event loop. So what we're doing, and this is related to a talk I saw earlier today, is we are queuing this in the leave UB event loop, uh, thread pool, sorry. <coughs> so let's run this again. And this should be a lot faster. Why? Because the leave UB thread pool has four uh, threads, so they can run each on a separate processor. And if we take a look at our flame graph, you, we will notice that it actually doesn't have any, um, sorry, we go. it doesn't have any pointers to the bcrypt code because it's all running in a different thread. So 0x doesn't consider that. And the call that you see here is that it's using p threads. So we can think, OK, we'll fix it. Well, like the famous actually is that we still have a problem, right? Because we are CPU bound and we are slow on purpose. So we need to scale. And scaling is not about just handling throughput. It's also about how much money you spend handling that throughput. Because like, if you buy a crazy supercomputer, well, it's not that good. So you can think about creating, like, using a faster hash function. The problem is that that's not as safe. The reason we use a slow hash function is that if someone gets a hand of the hashes, they have a hard time cracking them. So that's not an option for us. We're a security company. We don't want to go that way. Caching, that's like the first thing you think about. It's not applicable in this case because there's no temporality for the data access, right? You log in once, and then you might log in once again in 24 hours. There's no sense in caching. There are other problems with caching, but that's, imp that's not that important. Um, so scaling up. I always think of scaling up as like, burning money. But it's a good first approach. Because what you're doing is you're saying, OK, if I increase the size of the thread pool and I get more threads, I 
can get by for at least some time in production handling more load. And that's good. I think that's the first thing that one should do if one faces a situation like this one. But on the long run, you are going to be spending more money than you need because you don't have a clear execution profile and you have machines that are larger than you might need, right? You don't have a lot of atomicity. So then you go kind of the horizontal scaling way, which can be combined with like the, the, the vertical scaling. But if you create multiple odd services, you run into another problem, which is that the service not only allows you to log in, but it can also allow you to change your email. And changing your email is an I.O. bound operation because you just go to the database instead of like logging in, which is, again, CPU bound. So you run into the problem where if you have a lot of people changing their emails and you bought a really large computer just to kind of process password hashing, you are spending more money than you need to in, on different cores. We fixed this by creating a service called BAS. It's open source. You have the link there. And the idea is that you have the same interface as you do with Bcrypt, but it actually works like this. So you set up the bus service behind a load balancer. It communicates with a client using protocol buffers or Avro, depending on the day and your configuration. And it does two things. It either compares a password to a hash, or it hashes a password. That's it. The good thing is that it's very easy to figure out when this is actually going to be a bottleneck and auto scale because you can very effectively measure the amount of requests. You know that it takes between 70 milliseconds and 100 milliseconds to run a bcrypt comparison, so you can say, okay, I can handle like 10 of these per second. That's it, that's when you scale. Important, regardless of the numbers, is to always do the cost comparison. Did I achieve the desired throughput, and am I spending the lower amount of money that I can, right? So those are the two key things. And always fail gracefully when you introduce a new dependency. So you see, she's keeping her, her hands up, even though she didn't stick the landing. That's good. If you introduce a new dependency, you should be able to run things in a different way. So if the BAS cluster starts to fail, what we do is we uh, turn back to running the bcrypt comparison locally as a fallback. And that's, that gives our operations team time to figure out what's going on and get the cluster back up. It's not ideal in terms of cost, it's not ideal in terms of performance, but it's ideal in terms of, well, that's the best that we can do for our customers right now. One last thing, uh, cat picture. I was missing one of these, so I'm adding it. Um, if you have a long flight back home, like I do, to Argentina, uh, you can read all of these links. And there's more, wait, okay, that's it. Um, so I don't have anything else, I think we have two minutes for questions, and I hope this was useful. Thank you. <laughs>